and um, please feel free to add questions and comments in the chat. We're going to take about 30-35 minutes to have a discussion with myself and the authors and then after that we'll take about 10 minutes to have a discussion with the with the group and we'll respond to the chat questions if we don't get around to it today we'll answer those on social media so your questions will all be answered and i'd like to honor the land that i'm currently standing on here behind my laptop in victoria bc the first nations lekwungen peoples of the esquimalt and the songhees nation very grateful for uh finally solstice has arrived and so with it the sunshine um but i'm also grateful for the the coming together of all these different people from all over the place we did a brief weather check-in beforehand but um as the editor of this book, I'm extremely proud to have all of you and meet meet you here. So I'm going to ask Gretchen to start, just to say say a few words about yourself and your chapter. Sure, thank you. Well, it's great to see uh, everybody um, here, uh, authors as well as uh, attendees. And thank you, Michelle, for bringing us um, all together um, with this uh, awesome, inspiring kind of topic. Uh, my chapter, it's the last chapter in the book, is um, dedicated to um, art therapists and digital community and really the value of digital community, um, kind of the past, present, as well as the future. And um, some parts um, of the chapter include um, kind of doing a collaborative um, art exchange during um, the very uh, early days of COVID, like actually in March of uh, 2020. Uh, we're about 100 art therapists, students, and also like artists. We all uh, got sort of together, organized like online and did an artist trading card exchange while everybody was in like quarantine. And eventually when it was sort of safe, I guess, um, we physically exchanged um, those cards. And so the chapter kind of goes into uh, a little bit uh, about that. I know Catherine, I think uh, your art is sort of in the in that sort of chapter as well. And then uh, another sort of piece um, is that you that is unique to the chapter. This was pre-pandemic. Was that I um, launched a digital uh, time capsule about technology and art therapy actually in January of 2020 with the intention of maybe um, kind of opening it. It's through Google, like a Google form, like in 2030, and to see how things are different, people's thoughts, art therapists, and students around technology in 2020 um, versus 10 years and responses are still coming in. I know Michelle, many of your students are, um, I think one came in uh, today and that, that it's still sort of open and I can kind of see a little bit of pre sort of um, pandemic versus post now. Um, I think people have definitely been thinking about technology in totally different ways, um, but that is also um, highlighted a little bit sort of in the chapter, but just really the benefits of um, community sort of online and um, the connection and creativity that that can kind of create. Thank you so much, Gretchen. Yeah, and I think many of us certainly can't go back to only spending time with each other at annual conferences that are actually physical, right? Now we're sort of, we've tasted the, uh, the nectar of having more regular contact, mm -hmm. at least virtually. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's go to Michelle Radigan. Hi, everybody. Um, again, Michelle Radigan, use the pronoun she, her, um, speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape, where I am in southern New Jersey. Um, and I say southern New Jersey because we are more connected to uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
Pennsylvania. People who are in northern New Jersey are all rooting for the New York team. So go, <laughs> go Eagles, go Phillies, go Flyers, <laughs> go Sixers. Um, my chapter was uh, chapter 12. It's called Cameras Off, Coffee On, uh, Teaching and Learning in COVID Times. And um, the title was really very important because you know, teaching online is not necessarily innovative to some of the programs who do have online programming. Uh, but for where I'm teaching in graduate art therapy and counseling, we had a week to pivot uh, when COVID happened. And the way that the school and a lot of schools were handling it was, well, it's a three hour class, just lecture for three hours, mm -hmm. just as if, if you were in person. And I'm also a doctoral student and my doctorate happens to be online. And I was also lucky enough to take a um, essentials and online teaching course before COVID happened. And I thought I, and I also have children in college, two children in college and saw how they were struggling when their schools were just lecturing as if they were in person and how detrimental it was to their learning. Um, and I thought, I just can't do that. So um, I refused and um, we did things a little bit different and I didn't make the synchronous times uh, mandatory. And I did an art coffee house. I said, come with coffee or tea, come with art supplies. Um, don't necessarily come with an agenda. And so I built a lot of asynchronous activities. We used a, a lot of online things such as uh, Flipgrid. Uh, students didn't have access to a studio. So I did a community fundraiser and I personally shipped art supplies to wherever they were sheltered in place at the time all over the United States. Um, so they had access to work with materials. And um, we just spent an hour and a half together with coffee and art materials and talked about what was happening in our lives and really created uh, a solid community, a neighborhood of learners, if you will, where we collaborated. And I was just astounded by how much learning did happen. Uh, and it was really a good reminder for me of how important it is to slow down in teaching, um, how it was really an important reminder for me that um, we're not going to get to every single little nugget in the syllabus, but there was so much teaching and learning that happened that was preparing them for being uh, really good clinicians for when they graduated. And so now that we're back in person, um, I held on to some of those uh, techniques now that we're back in the classroom uh, because the students found it really helpful to have pre-recorded lectures. Some of the students who, um, you know, have our diverse learners um, really appreciated the ability to listen uh, and rewind and replay rather than miss things in class. And then we were able to take deeper dives with a flipped uh, classroom model. And so again, some of this may not be uh, brand new experiences to some classes that are typically online for art therapy in particular. Uh, but for me, it was taking, how can we do this didactic experiential three hour course that explores the expressive therapies continuum and uh, turn it on its head and do something uh, really robust and, and amazing. And that's what the chapter talks about. And I combined um, Abby Miller's El Duende, uh, One Process Canvas, uh, along with um, exploring the expressive therapies continuum and uh, highlighted a student in there and uh, her video is in there. And I hope that um, those of you who have the book uh, get a chance to check that out uh, because it really was transformational, not just for me, but, but also for the students. And I'm just so grateful that they were willing to do something different with me uh, in that spring quarter of 2020. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I particularly loved that video, so I definitely encourage everyone to check that out. So innovative. Um, I would like to ask Catherine to go next. Hi, everyone, and thank you. Um, I am across the river from Michelle in the land of the Lenape Indians. I am right in uh, Philadelphia. Um, my chapter, uh, and I'm also a PhD student, not in the same program that Michelle is in, um, although in the same department. 
Um, I've had a 20 year career um, clinically working with uh, children, teens and, and their families. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm doing my PhD is to look at um, uh, some of the, the benefits in addition to mental health benefits, but some of the literacy benefits to art therapy, especially in a um, high needs uh, preschool environment. So I'm really interested in um, early learning and early stages of, of development, um, which really focuses a lot on sensory motor activity and um, relationship building that's very much, you know, following the child's lead. Um, I work with all ages. And so my chapter does talk about some of the teenagers that I've worked with, um, but certainly uh, one of the greatest challenges of pivoting to online telehealth um, is working with those really young children that I've, I've spent my career focusing on. Um, but even for some of the teenagers, uh, having a sense of safety and privacy was still quite a concern. So I um, really, uh, you know, I was so grateful. I have a team of therapists at my clinical practice, and I was so grateful that we could fairly quickly pivot to telehealth. Um, I had already had an online practice management software that offered telehealth. Um, it didn't have all of the features that many other platforms did at first, but it now has a share screen technology and a whiteboard technology. Um, but we had to dig and find um, the Google Jamboard uh, where we could share screens and, and be really creative and, um, and, and work together. Um, a big emphasis that I found was, you know, how to really create that sense of connection and safety, this kind of uh, magic circle as I've, I've uh, you know, come to dig into the literature on, on play theory and, and kind of unpack and discover. Um, this is what we do in therapy, our presence and our offering of art materials and our ability to really follow the lead of our, our clients is really predicated on creating this kind of um, uh, uh, sensibility, this kind of aura that wraps whatever is happening in the nonverbal relationship, the nonverbal underpinnings. Um, so I really had to think hard about how to create that in, in a, a square virtual format um, where I could be anywhere in the child's house with any person uh, you know, in the background, although parents uh, and caregivers were really wonderful about finding private spaces and establishing some boundaries physically in the spaces that the children were in. Um, but we certainly found a lot of benefits. Uh, some schools in, in the greater Philadelphia area where I see kids uh, went back to live and in person in the fall of 2021. The public schools did not. So I was able to flex my schedule and I did see some children in their school environment because they were in sort of a hybrid model anyway. And so teachers and faculty would find space for the children and it made it um, really convenient to fit a lot in um, and to see kids in some of the spaces where they were feeling most anxious and unsettled. Um, it's made it really, uh, really convenient to do parent sessions when parents might be in different locations and, and working and, and leading very busy lives and sometimes fitting parent sessions, uh, you know, prior to COVID would mean dropping the children off at school and not getting to work at their usual time. So, um, so there have been many, many conveniences to, to really learning this telehealth platform. Um, and, and for many of the, the kids and teens that I'd already had a relationship with, it was very easy to pivot. They knew me, they knew a lot of what we were uh, going to be doing. Um, I could easily give their parents a list of art supplies. In some cases I did drop off art supplies or send packages. Um, what was really tricky was getting to know new kids. And over time, getting to know new kids who might have already been trying telehealth at various points during the pandemic. So we saw a real craving for live and in-person therapy again. Um, in the summer of 2021, I tried to meet with as many of my kids around the city as I could. We would meet in parks and just touch base, just have that physical sense of being near each other, even if we were spread out on an eight foot long picnic blanket. <laughs> um, but we had those little touch points. And I think that's a real lesson to this as well. Thinking about when you do need to have those physical touch points, um, 
and, and likewise, when it's okay to pivot, I have a, a youngster who I've been seeing live and in person uh, for this past year. He's starting summer camp. He's exhausted at the end of the day. Last week we did virtual and um, neither of us expected that it was going to go really well, but it went really well. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that this is part of the, the, the data that I hope we can all be really capturing and monitoring and noting. Um, uh, so so my, my chapter focuses on what that's like with children. Again, noting that there are just so many challenges to that physical presence and the sensory motor experiences. Um, although these are some things that we can really overcome in lots of ways too. In the chapter, I talk about sending home recipes for salt dough and having parents um, set up simple non, non cooked salt dough so that we could have some tactile and sensory experiences. Um, and, and like never before, I've seen some real personal aspects of children when we go on treasure hunts in their room and I spy kinds of activities as, as part of our, our session and our routine. So it's been lovely in terms of some of those little, um, little intimacies that you might not get when, when people come into your office. So I'll wrap up with that. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I, I imagine that the technical fluency of many children helped a lot. And I think that's a good segue to go to Margaret, who is Absolutely. very bravely dealing with um, older adults. And uh, yes, so I'm going to pass the floor to Margaret. Hang on. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> I am uh, Margaret Carlock Russo, and I'm very happy to be here. And yes, um, as Michelle mentioned, my chapter is about reaching older adults using virtual platforms. Um, and so what I started out, I had been working in a in-person setting, working on a closed um, memory care uh, neighborhood is what we called it, an area. And uh, and so I had a lot of opportunity to engage individuals because I was there in person and, and could look at cues and um, they could see me and relate to me in some way. But when all that stopped at um, the beginning of COVID, it, it, people were also, it, I was working in a community. So people living in a community, um, it was kind of shut down. They weren't even allowing family members to visit, let alone therapists to come in. So. Um, it was a very difficult time and I was really feeling um, that there's so much difficulty in communicating and connecting with individuals who are experiencing memory loss or uh, things like aphasia where they can't really communicate what is going on for them and what their experiences are. So I um, thought, I, I, kept, I kept just struggling to figure out how could I possibly um, create an, a virtual environment that would be useful uh, or that would even be relevant to people who, who are in that situation. And so um, we thought about doing like a large class, a large group in one area with a big TV, all these kinds of ideas were happening. But um, what I decided, I, I actually was working with individuals I switched. I stopped working in that facility and I went to working um, in my own private practice with individuals who were, um, I don't want to say stuck at home, but isolated at home, right? We were all sort of in that mode um, during the beginning of the pandemic, but individuals who really had um, needed more interaction, needed more social engagement. So the, the areas of focus that I worked on were exactly that, social connection, um, a sense of purpose, having, you know, uh, having something to do during the day that is um, expected, you know, that is a time um, that they can really know, okay, this is my time to work, so to speak, or to express or to have my, my um, special moment. So that kind of thing, I was working on ability to focus, um, and also um, just connecting. And so what I decided to do was create, and this was in my own mind, really controversial because I decided to do pairs and have a caregiver and an individual, uh, whether it was a loved one or, or a, um, you know, a, a 
nursing aide or whoever, but to have a pair and have that same caregiver be there all the time. And so I had to really dissect and the chapter goes into some of the considerations about what is a therapy session for these individuals? What, um, what do we do about uh, privacy and confidentiality and things like that? What do we do about, um, I've had some pairs where one of the, the, the um, child of the individual was their caregiver. And so that creates another dynamic. Um, and what I came to, we, we, I sorted all those out. I talked to the caregivers. Um, and what I sorted out was that I think the interaction opportunity was more powerful and more useful than getting stuck in all those little aspects. We tried our best to be, um, <coughs> sorry, we tried our best to be, um, you know, as confidential as possible, respectful as possible. And what I did often was have um, the caregiver uh, be there to set up supplies, to get the uh, Zoom session going and all that. And then to kind of uh, leave the person, not leave the room, but leave the person to do their own interaction. So there was also a learning capacity with caregivers to be able to see the individuals they're working with in a different light. Because I mean, from those of us that are art therapists or uh, other types of um, uh, teachers and caregivers and, and mental health professionals, uh, we might know that individuals might act differently when they're using nonverbal skills. They may be able to express things differently. So I was focusing on that. And then at the same time, allowing the caregiver to create their own art. So therefore, they also were having that opportunity to maybe relieve some stress, to um, focus on themselves for a little while, to just have something that they could engage in that was nourishing for them as well. So we tried to tried a pilot of uh, six weeks and um, had a small group and then we worked things out. And so uh, what I discovered was I went back over the things that were most important in the sessions that I, or had the most effect in the sessions that I did in person and I really tried to distill that down and then try to make sure that kind of activity or engagement was happening in this virtual session. And so, like I said, um, there was uh, not so much concern about expression and processing as it was about the creative experience. So I sent, I, would, I created um, directives ahead of time were just uh, lists of materials that people could have. And I tried to also be mindful of what was in people's homes, what might be just, um, you know, more easy for them to get their hands on. So they were very basic. We did collage materials, we did found objects, we did, um, you know, we did do some drawing, but it was open to whether whatever people had on hand. Um, and it worked out well that way. I gave the, um, you know, I gave the list of the week before so people had a chance to <clears throat> try to get things together. And I was very lenient on exactly what they were using. It was more about the engagement. And what I found over time was really that um, a for me, I think it was a beautiful thing because uh, there was that ability. I heard some other people talking about the, the struggle to make that connection. Um, and I was really surprised that even through the computer um, that we ritualized what was happening, right? And so we had the same kind of format. I was there the same type we talk about things, we get into the art as soon as possible and let people create. And it was a, an opportunity where people, um, not gonna say they related to each other that much, but where they connected with me and they were able to engage. Um, and I'm still like, I've broken off from the group model um, to having more individualized sessions and that changes the dynamic. But I think that this is a really important opportunity um, that I want to really, research more and um, delve into more because there are so many older individuals who are are, are isolated or are, are really looking for connection are really looking for um, stimulation cognitive stimulation and a way to share what's going on inside of them so although my directives were um, quite open we all we did have processing and it was a lot of a lot of it was very um perhaps very um literal, but there were moments where people were bringing out, you know, uh, um, situations about life review or, or dealing with disability, dealing with decline and limited 
um, skills, loss of skills, things like that were coming out in the conversation. So I do think that um, over time, when we built the rapport in the group, there were opportunities for individuals to really gain on a lot of different levels. So, um, so that's, that's where I am now. And I really would love to figure out a way um, to explain, expand this because I do, I do think that um, it, it is a viable um, situation for, for older adults and, and it's easy enough to get, or it's, I shouldn't say easy enough, but it's possible to get the assistance that you need maybe with technology or with gathering materials, or I have some individuals who need, have mobility issues. And so they need assistance getting in front of the computer or whatever. So, uh, I think those things are surmountable and the, that the, um, benefit of engaging is far outweighs the difficulties that we might have in the beginning of getting things set. So, so that's where um, I end my chapter goes into a couple of different examples of things that I did. And um, hopefully, I'll be able to um, continue this as we as we move forward. Um, now that we can be sometimes back in person, but there's still a lot of you know, tentativeness about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm still going ahead with virtual as well. So. Thank you so much, Margaret. Yeah. I was I was so struck by your creative problem solving and mm -hmm. very much about the um, your your kind of trial and error is documented mm -hmm. in the chapter, which I really appreciated because we're still all going through that, even though we've been in this virtual world for a while. And I'm also very much struck by the benefit to the caregivers, whether they're known mm -hmm. or or simply paid um, to do mm -hmm. the work that they're doing. I'm sure the value to them is significant, you know, mm -hmm. and we know that um, for Catherine's, the parents of the children receiving treatment, the there's a benefit there, but we expect the care, the mm -hmm. parent caregivers to be invested in that outcome, whereas um, yours are a little more anecdotal and um, mm -hmm. I think that's still extremely valuable, right? Absolutely. And I also, uh, just really briefly, I also think that caregivers are so often overlooked in the stresses yes. that they have. And um, this is really an opportunity to allow them a little bit of a reprieve and also to allow them to see abilities, perhaps in the people they work with that they wouldn't have otherwise seen because of the different type of engagement. So lots of benefits. Um, I as an aside, Dr. Pamela Whitaker did an interesting project she didn't write much about in her chapter, but it was with seniors in the Chicago area, pairing them with practicum students doing virtual walking um, studios. So oh. maybe I can put you two in touch about oh. that because I think that would be some fascinating research. Yes, as that would be step. fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I'd love that. Um, Oh, it's all so yummy. Okay, Jessica, <laughs> we'd love to hear about your important work as well. All right, so greetings from Chicago, land of the Three Fires tribes. Um, so my chapter is chapter three, Experiences of Art Therapists During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, and this was for my graduate thesis. Um, so what I did is I interviewed art therapists about their experiences transitioning to teletherapy during the pandemic. Um, and then I used grounded theories um, from their interviews to pull out different themes. And some of the themes that I found most interesting um, was this idea of reconceptualizing materials. Um, so what that meant is that um, because a lot of clients didn't have access to typical art materials anymore when they were quarantined, such as paints, um, oil pastels, etc., therapists started using materials that the clients naturally gravitated towards. So someone mentioned using cosplay makeup in sessions or plants or found objects or journaling. Um, so I thought that was really interesting how therapists were able to adapt mm -hmm. what it means to use art materials in therapy. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And uh, your thesis advisor is here as well, Dr. Kali. Um, Kate, would you want to share just a little bit about why you connected Jessica's work with, with us? Just unmute yourself. All right, unmute. Um, 
I don't want to take credit for being a thesis advisor because somebody else had that role. Okay. I was invited to be a, an external leader. And I think my, my um, opinions actually carried some weight, but well, it just seemed like such a wonderful coincidence, Michelle, that when you had asked me to help with the book a little bit and help determine what chapters might be in the book, that along should come Jessica with, with, this, with this work that she had done on the topic she just described. And um, I thought about it and looked through her thesis and thought, this is publishable work. So congratulations again, Jessica for doing such good work. And not only that, but that her thesis could go into the book sort of as it was. It didn't have to be adapted or turned into something else. Yeah. It, was a nat it was a natural fit. Well, and at that time, and probably for the next 10 years, having themes emerge is really important because we, we're all quite, we're doing our own explorations and sometimes coming together like this, but to have it documented in a fairly um, sort of specific, clear way, considered way is so important. Um, and, and Michelle, I noticed that you asked a question, would you like to speak a bit about the value of gathering the data or something about your question? Because of course mm -hmm. we have some dialogue here about that. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I was thinking about, and um, when Catherine first was speaking, um, you used the term data and how you were gathering data. And then, you know, Margaret is speaking about wanting to do more research. And now yeah. Jessica is talking about grand, grounded theory mm -hmm. and pulling together this data. And so, you know, this is where this is my own soapbox, right? This is where we are weakest yes. um, in, in art therapy. Um, because even though we're even talking now, we're talking anecdotally and we're talking yeah. about stories and stories are so powerful. But unfortunately in the places where we work, everyone wants the gold standard. They want evidence-based, mm -hmm. they want random uh, controlled trials. So I'm just curious if there's any authors on now um, that can envision taking what you're doing or do you have the ability to take what you're doing and pair up with a researcher if you don't feel that you have the bandwidth or the uh, viability or feasibility to do it, to take this further and do some really robust research. Because, you know, this is the second panel discussion that I've been a part of. And um, I, the things that are coming out of this book and what people are talking about are just amazing. And, there's going to be someone else in another profession who once again feels like they've discovered art therapy, yeah. right? Like they've recreated the wheel. Like I just made the wheel. <laughs> Even before coming on today, I saw a Facebook post about an eight week course to get certified in art therapy. And I wanted to pull my eyebrows out. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so I think it's one of those things where as much as it pains us or doesn't pain us, we have we have to bite the bullet and um, do this RCT type of research, this evidence-based research. And I'm just curious, is there anyone out there who's already thinking it? And I'm looking at you, Jessica, as this young whippersnapper <laughs> who's already started with the uh, with the grounded theory, which needs to also be in a journal article, right? Yeah. Um, and taking it further. So I'm curious, what what are some of the authors thinking about? And is there anyone who's on the call who's thinking, I'm a researcher, let me pair up with you and let's do this. So let's open that up for a discussion. <laughs> extremely important topic. Who would like to take a stab at it? Just, I wanted to um, definitely uh, sort of support what Michelle um, was just um, speaking about. And I think um, 
the pandemic really accelerated. I mean, lots of stuff with technology, but I think it really accelerated our therapists to think in a practical way about technology that they really hadn't done previously um, because they were sort of forced to, you know, a lot of art therapists like kind of disregarded technology or didn't like have that as a choice, you know? And I think it really forced people to be like, wow, this is possible in practice, in education, in art making, all of that. And I think it will continue to propel like research uh, and Jessica's work I think is 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 brilliant because you're like the future of art therapy um we're sort of I don't know I feel like closer to like not you know like you were definitely you know and and caring sort of that is so important and I feel that Michelle's book has um, done that I know the British Association of Art Therapy the Association of Art Therapists they had a online issue that I help um, guests edit like about online art therapy and add as public. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's like coming out. And I feel like the purpose of that is to add to the, the body of research that actually like Kate was doing like long ago, like two decades sort of ago. It's just awesome to have more voices and more settings, more populations. It's really amazing. So yeah, that's sort of my kind of thoughts. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in as well as somebody who's Please. just going into research after many a clinical year uh, years. Um, I think that it's really imperative that we create these networks of people that are doing um, allied work. My work is really rooted in the clinical experience. Um, I, I don't... Um, I think that there's a lot of value to different levels of research, including randomized controlled trials, but I think that we don't need to start thinking all the way at that top of the empirically based hierarchy of, of, um, of research. I think that, you know, starting with grounded theory and start, starting with, um, you know, even more rigorous data collection around who's using telehealth, what is our experience of it, and then what is the experience of the end user, yeah. um, you know, the caregivers, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the adult clients with uh, cognitive decline. Um, th those things are hard to conceptualize because there's going to be so many different experiences, which is what the, you know, clinical experience is about. No, no two people come for any kind of therapy for the same reason and with the same goals and, and, um, and needs. And I think that we really do need to think about our research as being that complex. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that creating these networks of people that are doing um, similar work and continuing the dialogue, continuing to jump off of that grounded theory into a next level of, um, of, of data collection telling the stories is actually really wonderful. You just need many of them yeah. and, and where you can start to see similar patterns and rigorously collect that and, and, and keep putting it out there to the powers that be who need to know that this is really good work. It's really powerful. And there really are good end results, even if everybody's initial orientation and goal is different because of the clients that you work with and the individual needs that are arising. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, keeping, keeping good contact with clinicians and people that, that do have some form of research lab, so to speak, you know, a, a place where you can um, contact an IRB and, and set up that, that rigorous study, but it doesn't have to be like at that, we have, we have to break through that notion um, that that is the gold standard there, there, there should be more than one gold standard. Thank you. Um, part of, part of researching for this book, I got tipped off by Kate, of course, to meet with Dr. Eva Fattorini, who wrote our foreword. And, um, it's not written about much in this book, but her, uh, I believe Gretchen, you're involved a little bit and Garija is in the, uh, her, um, database her her website are to seen to with a very keen interest in research uh, and um, part of it I think she's um, created some apps drawing apps and collage apps 
as part of that that would help um, with the research aspect of it, but while also serving clients around the world. So we can all look out for that and hopefully perhaps we, we start a working group on the research piece and maybe we can um, keep connected and meet in six months or let's stay after for a few minutes and decide how we might want to do this and maybe we could invite Kate and um, I don't know, maybe Lynn Capitan would want to come and we could get Eva to join us. Um, let's think big here and be a little bit organized about some of the research because I know it's easier to even start these projects with the collaboration, right? Because we've got some of us have some smaller resources in, in terms of the, you know, the, the financial aspect of the research, but just having a plan together um, could be really helpful. Um, thank you for your comment, Hannah, here. Would you like to say a few words about it also? You could, we have time for you to speak it. Um, sure, just thank you everyone uh, for all of your comments. Um, so interesting and I think the, the kind of focus on research moving forward is so important. Um, and just as I, as I mentioned in the chat, I'm currently working as a research coordinator looking at using um, assistive technology, uh, like sensor technology in the home. Um, of older adults with memory loss to kind of assist caregivers being able to enable the older adult to continue living at home. Um, and just hearing Margaret's comments, I think one of the biggest challenges that we've been facing is, is actually recruiting caregivers because they already have so much on their plate. And so kind of all the upfront work we have to do with the research of, you know, outlining all the, the consent process, making sure that everyone is informed um, that takes a, that takes a good chunk of time, and I think it's hard with the random control trials that you know some of them will be placed in the group that has the the perceived benefit and some will not. So, thinking of different interventions that could be done with art therapy, I think is is really exciting to be able to help caregivers see like like what you were saying about you know the skills and and interactions that may that they may not have otherwise seen um, with with the person they're caring for. So I definitely think this is an area that um, will grow a lot in the coming years and, and there's um, a lot to do as well with, with the virtual aspect. So it was really exciting to hear how well that, that's been working so far. And it gives me you know, a lot of things to kind of look out for in the future and think about you know, funding opportunities to support that type of research. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. I'll just jump in for a second and thank, thank you, Hannah. It's really interesting to hear what you're doing, but um, I just want to clarify that, yeah, it, it was not, or to agree with you, it was not easy to um, find pairs. And um, a lot of people were wanted to, um, you know, volunteer their loved one to participate, but it wouldn't happen without pairs. So uh, that is a challenge. Um, and I think for me, at least in the small experience that I've had, once the caregivers actually experienced a few sessions and got into it, they were much more engaged, much more willing to do the work that they needed to do because they also realized some benefit and also some reprieve from, even if it's the hour of the session, um, from um, the, the pressures that they have for the, the responsibilities. So yeah, you're bringing up an excellent point. Um, is that from me? Someone asked, are you only working with full-time caregivers? No, I am working with sometimes um, children, the client that I'm working with. Um, so it just has to be a consistent person in the sessions, but it's not always full-time caregivers. Wonderful. Thank you, Gretchen, for putting that in the chat in beta form, yes, that's important. So it's still coming. We can all keep uh, watching out for that. And I know Eva's uh, continuing to work on that. We also have author Lucille Prue here with us and uh, Pioneer. And I love seeing how quickly you just adapted Lucille to the virtual platform as well, so. How is it here, sitting here, listening to uh, to these other authors? It's it's wonderful, and I'm very interested in this lady as Margaret working with the seniors in pairs, mm -hmm. because we're 
I'm thinking of that moving it from my dyad work with the mother and child in attachment. And we found that because we couldn't always get the mother. So we had to get a caregiver that was not a relation even, but a steady person who would be with the child on the regular basis. And we found that the attachment work happens with whoever could be there to follow the child. And I think working with seniors in senior homes, if you have that same idea, I'm sure that the worker also gets a lot out of it, as well as the senior that they're working with. I'm so glad to hear you're doing that because that's the way I've been thinking lately, that that would be the way to help the seniors the ones that are losing their memory a bit, the ones that are losing some of their mobility, to have someone there to, to see them. Because I think there comes a time when they don't get seen. And just like the child, once he's seen by someone, he starts to grow. And although the seniors may be growth, may be slow, but there's still growth, there's still growth, there's still brain that can be used at some points. So I'm really happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. When it comes to technology, Michelle, for me, the most exciting part of the virtual art therapy was the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, is what I talk about in my chapter, squaring the Shavarian triangle. And because I felt that once the therapist was working with the student on the whiteboard, it's as if they were in the same room because their, their, their art, their, their colors of the, the thing that they, the, the color and the line that they chose to work with touch each other. They touch each other as if it was in reality. And I found that that was so exciting. Mm -hmm. I still do. Of course, I get excited about technology. I'm a real technology nut. <laughs> Because I find as, as I'm aging, technology is keeping me young and it's keeping me into the present. And that's what I like the most about the technology. But the, uh, the book itself, uh, Michelle, was, is quite a feat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure it will benefit a lot of our therapists because virtual work is not gone. It's here to stay. No, it really is. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lucille. And uh, yes, I, we're really exploring. How, we have about 10 student art therapists who um, provide low cost art therapy to our, our clients in our virtual art therapy clinic. And it's, it's a, it's a, it has some research potential and Kate is helping us on some projects with the clinic and one of them we write about in the book. Um, we're also discovering through trial and error some best practices for us and for students, including when we're working with children to have a caregiver or a parent present in the session um, and not just there to set up the computer and provide the art supplies, but to stay, to be part of the session, um, to be relationally connected to the art therapy student as well, because otherwise so much of it moves into email and then the, the visual, the, 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 tele, the, the session itself with the child alone it does, we've had some complications, so we're shifting to moving to, to really just having them be dyadic. So um, I'm actually gonna suggest, Angela, if you could write into the, um, onto Facebook for us and we'll, we'll chat about it because we, we need to honor our time right now. Um, but um, unless, unless it's really quick and related, um, I don't see you. I think you're off screen. I'm here. It's it's very quick and it's very okay. related. Uh, so I'll sure. be um, I'll be brief. Angela Eicher. I'm actually this is my first art therapy event in eight years. Um, I was a PhD candidate uh, in 2013 and stepped away to join a healthcare startup. So a healthcare. Mm -hmm. I'm in that. I was in the healthcare technology space for the past eight years. Um, successfully grew a startup to uh, a public offering and just exploring the behavioral health, digital health space 
and the specialness of art therapy in my family and my home as an art therapist. I spent the last six months kind of reevaluating where I wanted to be, and I really want to merge those worlds. Um, and so I think that there is a ton of work to do. I'm all in. Uh, my, my mojo is back to do some really great research, to really tap the brilliant minds on this call. I've already read the book through and through, highlighted through and through, uh, ready to have the conversations to say, how do we, how do we take this to the next level and, and spotlight and showcase what art therapists are doing in the virtual space so that space stays protected and special and sacred. Um, and it doesn't get overrun to Michelle's point and call for action by folks who maybe don't know um, the uniqueness of the profession and to make sure we have that representation. So thanks for the time. I will connect with each of you offline. Thank you, Angela. Nice to meet you. And yes, feel free to dialogue with us on social media or email. Be great to keep up. Thank you all very much for joining. Uh, the recording is available and will be on our channel. Uh, feel free to share it with uh, students or interested parties. And uh, authors, any of you who have an extra 10 minutes to stay on after, please feel free to. Um, we can figure out some next steps. So thank you again, everyone, and bye for now. Oh, gonna... I'm sorry. I forgot about the wheel. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Sarah. I was going to let you get away with it this time, but um, <laughs> I'm glad that someone uh, someone mentioned it. So I do have everyone, um, every viewer's name into a fancy dancy wheel on the side here. So I'm just going to click to spin to find out who wins a copy of our book see here. So the winner we have is Lauren Cormier. Lauren Cormier, you have won a copy of our book. So I will be in contact with you um, probably tomorrow to get your mailing address. <laughs> Lucky Lauren. Lucky Lauren. <laughs> Great. Great. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so you. much.